Good morning. If everyone please take their seats. The committee will come to order. Today, the committee meets to consider H.R. 4193, the Smart Savings Act, H.R. 4197, the All Circuit Review Extension Act, H.R. 4195, the Federal Register Modernization Act, H.R. 3635, the Safe and Secure Federal Website Act of 2014, H.R. 4174, the Alaskan Bypass Modernization Act. H.R. 4192, to amend the 1910 Heights of Buildings Act. H.R. 4185, the District of Columbia Courts Public Defender Service and Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency Act of 2014, a particularly catchy name. H.R. 4194, the Government Reports Elimination Act. And additionally, we will have two groups of postal namings today two that are extensions or, or, if you will, back up again from last Congress having passed this committee and the full House but having not been acted on by the Senate, and 12 postal namings for fallen American heroes. The committee will now consider H.R. 4193, the Smart Savings Act. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 4193, a bill to amend Title V, United States Code, to change the default investment fund under the Thrift Savings Plan and for other purposes. Without objection, H.R. 4193 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed and is in each of your folders. I will now recognize myself for a short opening statement. H.R. 4193 would change the default investment fund for thrift savings plan participants from the G fund, <coughs> which is, <coughs> excuse me, a, to, an, to an age appropriated asset allocation funds. What this effectively does for all government employees, with the exception of uniform military, is it recognizes that the government or G fund is one of the lowest paying but safest forms of investment. If a individual makes no other selection, the age appropriate asset allocation fund consistently outperforms the G fund and of course recognizes that when an individual is early in their investment cycle, they want high yield, while later in their investment cycle they want an assurance of return. For example, early in, in someone's career, perhaps in their 20s, the, a age-appropriated allocation fund weights heavily towards stocks and other investments of that sort in the private sector. Well, in the last few years before retirement, it would be virtually all in assured or G fund type investments. This is not to change the fact that any individual at the time they are filling out their original form may choose any fund, but in recognition that many people are in a hurry, this is a new job, and they may not readdress their investment for several years, this creates a default that is more likely to be fair to the employee and provide the highest balanced return. The TSP has, pre has found that it had it had the L funds been the default investment option since the beginning of automatic enrollment in 2010, participants would have achieved greater returns than investing so solely in the G fund. Again, this is a piece of legislation that in no way changes the options that a participant may choose. It simply provides a most likely to return properly investment for those who do not want to otherwise look at the specifics of their investment. I appreciate the ranking member's support on this bill. I urge all members to support it, and I yield to Mr. Cummings for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As an original co-sponsor on this bill, I thank uh, Chairman Eisen, the Congressman Fernhold and Woodall for working with me and Congressman Lynch and Conley on this bipartisan legislation that would amend current law to change the Thrift Savings Plan default investment option from the Government Securities Investment Fund, the G Fund, to the Life Cycle Fund, the L Fund. 
This bill makes uh, what I believe is a common sense change that will help our Federal uh, civilian employees save more effectively for their retirement. The Federal Retirement Thrift Investment Board, which manages the TSP, has indicated that many TSP participants are not actively managing their accounts and therefore not taking full advantage of their investment potential. The Thrift Board presented uh, data that showed that 33 percent of participants who were automatically enrolled in TSP accounts when they were hired have not changed their investment allocations and they remain totally invested in the G Fund. Many of these participants are young employees who would benefit from long-term investments in a diversified portfolio such as the L Fund, although there is little to no risk in investing in the G Fund because it is invested in U.S. Treasury securities and that are guaranteed by the United States Government. Over the long term, the return on the investment is significantly lower when compared to the L Fund. Between 2005 and 2013, the investment return on the G Fund was about 30 percent compared to 57 percent for L 2020 Fund and 62 percent for L 2030 Fund and 66 percent for L 2040 Fund. It is clear that they would have earned a lot more money if they had been in the L Fund. While past performance is not an indication of the future performance of the Fund, it does not uh, make sense to have our Federal employees miss out on potentially higher returns that the L Fund may provide over the long term. There is precedent for this in the private sector. Many private employees use life cycle funds as a default investment option for the 401k plans offered to their employees. Employer surveys conducted by uh, Aon Hewitt and Deloitte in 2011 show that nearly 80 percent of respondents use life cycle and target retirement date funds as a default investment option for their employees. In implementing this legislation, it would be critically important for the Thrift Board and the Federal agencies to thoroughly explain and make clear to TSP participants that the L Fund is subject to market fluctuations. I understand that there may be some workers who may be concerned about the market risk of the L Fund. That this bill would preserve the ability of all employees to change their allocations and transfer their contributions to the G Fund. Uh, I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to join me in supporting uh, this bipartisan legislation. And, Mr. Chairman, as I uh, conclude, I am hoping that Thrift will do all it can to inform people uh, of, the, of, of going back and trying to, to look at uh, not even being in a position for default, but going on and making those appropriate changes so that they can maximize the benefits coming out of uh, their savings. I think a lot of people, my mother used to say, it is nothing like a person who don't know what they don't know. A lot of people simply don't know, and they are losing a lot of money. And so I know our thrift people are, are going to uh, hearing this, but this may be one of those golden opportunities for them to say, okay, maybe we need to do even more in pushing this information out so that people can take an advantage of it. Uh, would that the gentleman up? yield? Yes, yield. Uh, with your joint effort, we will, uh, we will include in the report language a request that TSP contact all individuals currently in the G Fund to advise them of the new default. Good. And, 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 and uh, reclaiming my time, with that information that I just talked about, showing them a, the, the past record of the L Fund and, I mean, what the difference, I think when people really realize that they could make a lot more money, uh, I think it will it, it, it'll, it'll just, it's just a good thing to do. And uh, I just want people to be informed. And once they are informed, they can make certain decisions of their own. Of course, the legislation will help with the default situation, but there are people I just think they just need to be aware. And I thank the Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Does any other member wish to speak on the bill? Does any member wish to offer an amendment? If there is no further discussion, I move the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 4193 to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. 
The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 4193 to the House. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The H.R. 4193, the Smart Savings Act, is ordered reported to the House. I will hold the record open until the end of the day that any member who would like to submit written statements may do so. The Committee will now consider H.R. 4197, the All Circuit Review Extension Act. The Clerk will please designate the bill. H.R. 4197, a bill to amend Title V United States Code to extend the period of certain authority with respect to judicial review of Merit Systems Protection Board decisions relating to whistleblowers and for other purposes. Without objection, H.R. 4197 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed and is in each of your folders. I uh, will now recognize myself. In November 2012, the President signed into law the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act. This bill was reported out of this committee after considerable bipartisan work. As the committee members may well know, whistleblowers <clears throat> are an invaluable asset to help us uncover waste, fraud and abuse, and potential criminal behavior within the Federal bureaucracy. Unfortunately, far too many whistleblowers experience some form of retaliation for their good intentions. It became apparent to the Committee that many whistleblowers also may not have been getting their fair shake <coughs> in Federal Circuit Court. Therefore, the Whistleblower Protection en uh, Enhancement Act creates a two-year pilot allowing that all circuit review of whistleblower appeals enable whistleblowers cases, uh, causes of action to be appealed outside the Federal Circuit. In the 15 months since the law's enactment, only three appeals have been heard outside the Federal Circuit. This is an insignificant, uh, sorry, insufficient sample size to allow Congress to judge whether the various courts are appropriate venues for whistleblower appeals. The bill was introduced by the ranking member and co-sponsored by me and simply extends the period two additional years uh, so that we may further review the effects of the pilot. Extending the pilot will provide additional evidence to Congress to consider as we seek to determine whether what is the fairest and most efficient way for whistleblowers' cases to be handled under the Fed court system. I want to thank uh, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for introducing this important legislation, and I urge endorsement. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The reason I introduce this legislation is to extend an important provision of the Whistleblower Protection and Act, Enhancement Act, which was signed into law on November 27, 2012. Under the law, whistleblowers were allowed to file appeals in any circuit court of appeals with jurisdiction for the two-year period following enactment. That two-year period will expire on November 27, 2014. My bill would extend the all-circuit review provision for an additional three years. If this provision were to sunset, whistleblowers could only appeal a decision by the Merit Systems Protection Board to the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. The Federal Circuit has become increasingly restrictive of whistleblower rights in its decisions over the years. The Court recently made an egregious decision in the case of Kaplan versus Conyers by holding, by, by holding that the Merit Systems Protection Board may not review the merits of a determination by the Department of Defense concerning whether an employee is eligible to occupy a sensitive position that implicates national security. United States Special Counsel Carolyn Lerner said the ruling poses a significant threat to whistleblower protections for hundreds of thousands of Federal employees in the sensitive positions and may chill civil servants from blowing the whistle. Although allowing other circuits to consider appeals in whistleblower cases provides a peer review process and a check on the Federal Circuit. Two years have has, uh, not been enough time to evaluate whether the all circuit review provision works as intended as only a handful of cases have made their way to other circuits so far. My bill also would allow the Office of Personnel Management to file for reviews of M MSPB decisions in circuits 
other than the Federal Circuit for an additional three years. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for agreeing to be an original co-sponsor of this bill. I, along with Chairman uh, Fahrenthold, Ranking Member uh, Connolly, and Representative Van Hollen. I hope every member of the committee will support this bipartisan bill. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. I will hold the record open until the end of the day that all members who would like to submit a written statement. Does any member wish to further speak on the bill? Does any member wish to offer an amendment? If there is no further discussion, I move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 4197 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. The question is on favorable, favorably reporting H.R. 4197 to the House. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? No. In the opinion of the Chair, the, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. The H.R. 4197, the All Circuit Review Extension Act, is ordered reported to the House. The Committee will now consider H.R. 4195, the Federal Register Modernization Act. The Clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 4195, a bill to amend Chapter 15 of Title 44, United States Code, commonly known as the Federal Register Act, to modernize the Federal Register and for other purposes. Without objection, H.R. 4195 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed and is at in, in folders at each of your locations. The Federal Register Modernization Act provides the Office of Federal Register flexibility to establish more efficient standards for publication of, of the Federal Register. Current law requires paper printing and distribution of the Federal Register, but with modern technology, paper printing has become a often unnecessary expense and burden. Also under current law, agencies are required to submit three copies, paper copies, of the same document. Decades ago, the multiple copies served a purpose, but now agencies are submitting multiple electronic files uh, of the exact same document. Simply, this bill removes two outdated statutory requirements allowing for uh, alternative publication methods for the Federal Register that will increase efficiency and improve interaction with the public. I now recognize Mr. Cummings for his opening comment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I am happy to be an original uh, co-sponsor of the Federal Register Modernization Act. This is a, a good government bill that would reduce waste, improve efficiency, and save taxpayers money. Uh, this bill is based on a legislative proposal sent to the Congress by the National Archives and Records Administration. The bill would allow agencies to stop sending unnecessary paper copies of documents when they submit materials to be published in the Federal Register. The National Archives estimates that this one step could save almost $900,000 over five years. The bill also would give the Office of the Federal Register more flexibility to publish the Federal Register electronically. This would modernize the statute and make the Federal Register more accessible and more useful to the public. I urge all of our members to support the bill, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. We will hold the record open until the end of the day so all members who would like to submit written statements may. Does any member wish to speak on the bill? Does any member wish to offer an amendment? If there is no further discussion, I move the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 4195 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. The question now occurs on favorably reporting H.R. 4195 to the House. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The H.R. 4195, the Federal Register Modernization Act, is reported to the House. The Committee will now consider H.R. 3635, the Safe and Secure Federal Website Act of 2014. The Clerk will pre please designate the bill. H.R. 3635, a bill to ensure the functionality and security of new Federal websites that collect personally identifiable information and for other purposes. Without objection, H.R. 3635 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment 
in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3635, offered by Mr. Bentivoglio of Michigan. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and open for further amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed and is in each of your folders. I now recognize the gentleman from Michigan to uh, explain for an opening statement and to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and fellow members of the committee. H.R. 3635, the Safe and Secure Federal Websites Act, addresses an important problem facing Americans throughout the country. Every day, hackers attack websites looking for ways to steal personal information. We must ensure that our constituents can confidently use federal websites without the fear of a security lapse. Our job as members of Congress is to protect the public trust. My amendment does that. It covers federal websites that collect personally identifiable information, such as social security numbers, dates of birth, or credit card numbers. These websites would be required to do the following. One, before being launched, the agency's chief information officer must certify to Congress that the website is fully functional and secure. Two, the website must comply with existing information security gu guidelines published in the United States Code. Three, federal employees and contractors who have access to personal information must be vetted and agree to keep all information confidential. Four, agencies who have launched websites during the past 18 months would be given a period of time to adhere to these guidelines and provide certification. This is something on which this committee can work together on a bipartisan basis. We have the duty to protect our constituents, especially if they are being directed by our offices to use federal websites that require their personal information. If Americans cannot trust federal websites, they would be leery of going on these websites and finding the information and services they need. Thank you again for, cons for the consideration of this important bill, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Cummings is recognized for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We all agree that f federal agency websites must be secure in order to protect uh, taxpayers from being the victims of an information security breach. For that reason, I support the amendment in the nature of a substitute uh, to the Safe and Secure Federal Websites Act. The recent data breaches at Target, Neiman Marcus, and other retail establishments affected more than 100 million Americans, and the importance of information security cannot be overstated. It is the responsibility of the Congress to ensure that the Federal Government is not the source of these types of data breaches and to ensure that the personally identifiable information of American citizens is not compromised. This bill would require agency chief information officers to certify to Congress the functionality and security of, an, of new or substantially modified websites that will contain personally identifiable information. I believe these requirements are positive beginning steps in preventing harmful da data breaches within the Federal Government and commend Representative Betavolio for introducing this legislation. I also thank Mr. Connolly for his contribution to this legislation and for his hard work on data security issues over the many years. Mr. Connolly is expected to introduce an amendment to this bill that puts forth policies and procedures for agencies to follow in the event of a breach of information security involving disclosure of personally identifiable information. Mr. Chairman, I hope we can work together to move this bill forward in a bipartisan way. I also hope we can work together to ensure that uh, this bill is compatible with the existing framework of the Federal Information Security Management Act and that it would be uh, workable for agencies. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. I will hold the record open so anyone who wishes to, before the end of the day, may include, sub, and, sub, include written statements. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Oh. Ms. May. The gentleman is recognized. Move strike last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Um, I, I won't take that long. I just wanted to commend uh, Congressman Devolio for his hard work on this. I know he's put a lot of work into it, and it is something that we see, I know, from my district and others. This is something that's discussed all the time, and it is, it's continually the privacy issues and how do we protect those and how do we make sure that we're doing what we're doing. And I just wanted to, to commend uh, 
the congressman from Michigan on his hard work and also others who have, have put into this, but I just want to put in uh, that word to say this is something that's important and I appreciate him bringing it forward. And I, that I yield back. Does any member wish to offer an amendment? Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for the purpose of offering an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3635 offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia. <laughs> the amendment will be considered as read and the gentleman is recognized. I thank the chair. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my amendment is a modified version of the Federal Agency Data Breach Notification Act of 2014. The amendment enhances our nation's current statutory framework governing the protection of Americans' personally identifiable information, PII, held in agency information systems. According to the Federal Government's Central Information Security Incident Center, known as the U.S. Computer Emergency Readiness Team, the number of data breaches involving PII reported by Federal agencies increased from 10,481 in fiscal year 2009 to 22,156 incidents in fiscal year 2012, a 111 percent increase in that brief time period. This amendment will close loopholes in federal privacy requirements and streamline federal oversight of agency implementation of privacy policies and procedures pertaining to agency responses to security incidents involving PII. The Federal Data Breach Notification Amendment would also ensure consistent implementation of OMB guidance addressing the prevention of data breaches involving PII and the prompt notification of affected individuals when such breaches occur. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of jurisdiction with respect to OMB in this committee. Taken together, the enhancements contained in the Federal da Agency Data Breach Notification Amendment would ensure that every Federal agency has robust data breach notification procedures in place to secure PII and provide timely notification in the unfortunate event of a successful data breach of an agency system. I want to thank my colleague, Mr. Bentavolio, for working with me on this amendment. I believe it's acceptable to him. I want to thank him for his leadership on his underlying bill. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and your staff for working, and of course, Mr. Cummings, the distinguished ranking member as well. And with that, I Would yield. the gentleman yield? Of course. I'm not going to take individual time, but I want to thank you for your hard work on this. And, and note that uh, the Committee on Homeland Security also has jurisdiction, and it's, it's helpful that we're each working in ways that do not conflict the existing law, which includes reporting uh, specifically to uh, Department of Homeland Security. But I think the idea that the individual needs to be informed is, is yet another recognition that in this day and age, this can and does happen. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I thank the gentleman yield for the yield. Of course, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I support this amendment and appreciate the leadership of the ranking member of the Government Operations Subcommittee, Representative Connolly. And I also appreciate all the hard work of Mr. Ventavolio. Um, this is so very, very important. Uh, when we had the target breach, I never forget going to church uh, right after that came out and had so many people who came up to me telling me that they had gotten notices uh, from Target saying that they need to check their accounts and all that kind of thing. And this is what this committee uh, must be about. And I realize that's private, but we also have to do what this legislation uh, carries out. This amendment establishes the policies and procedures for agencies to follow in the event of a data breach involving the disclosure of personally identifiable information. The amendment would codify existing OMB guidance to require that when such information is compromised, a notice must be provided to the affected individuals within 72 hours. And this is so very, very important uh, for people to know that they may be vulnerable uh, so that they can take the appropriate actions. It also requires timely reporting to a Federal Cybersecurity Center. This is a good amendment to a very good bill, and I urge the committee to support it, and I yield back. I, I yield back to the gentleman. Thank, I thank the distinguished member, and I yield back to well, Thank you, gentlemen. Anyone Chairman else? Chairman Yield. Ricky. Chairman Yield. Uh, uh, it's the gentleman's oh. time. Of course, I'd be glad to yield. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank my friend uh, Congressman Conley from Virginia for making this bill uh, a better bill by offering this amendment. It's a good amendment. I fully support it, and I yield back. Thank you. I thank all the gentlemen. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized. Um, 
I, I thank the chairman. And let me preface my comments as well by saying that uh, I thank my colleagues from Virginia um, and Mr. Benevolio as well, uh, my, my colleague from uh, Michigan, for their efforts on this behalf. And in, f in, f in fact, this is once again one of those times where we are all aligned with the same objective. But we have to appreciate when we are doing this with the technical realities of what we are doing this that there's implications on the way we're asking the so-called bureaucracy to implement this. And that's where I have a particular concern. And I am concerned about the gentleman from Virginia's amendment to the amendment. And it has nothing to do with his intention to try to resolve the issue of creating greater protections. But what happens by virtue of the way this is being asked to be put together, I think it creates a problem. And I'd like to explain what I, what I think that, 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 that problem is. First, and this may be something which may appeal more to the members on my side of the aisle uh, than, than, than our colleagues on the other, but I think it's a very real question. And I think all of us appreciate that in this town, the balance goes back and forth over the long term. And so we jealously protect the ability of the separation of powers and our oversight capacity in Congress to hold the administration accountable for their actions. What will be being done here is the technical way in which this authority is going through OMB. What this means is it's not an independent government uh, agency overseen by Congress that will be assuring that the very protections that we're being asked to be put in place are provided. It will be the administration itself. So what we have is a situation in which they're being asked to be the whistleblower on themselves. I think we know how well we believe that works. M moreover, there, there's a concern here where we're talking about the, 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 the you know, powers that are increasingly accruing in the president. I believe we are creating a circumstance with a vote like this in which we are affirming that principle, which doesn't in my sense, I, I, I think we need to find a better way to accomplish this objective, but assure that some of the, the strengths are, are, are maintained here uh, in, in, in our Congress. And let me explain to you why. Because when you do it this way, we are working through the Office of OMB. Do you know how many people the Office of OMB has dedicated to this type of security? Two. Two people. Everything we're talking about is going to be overseen by two people. Won't be done. Yet, simultaneously, we have an existing mechanism that has been working because OMB asked the Department of Homeland Security to be overseeing this kind of activity. And in fact, that is the way that it has been working for some period of time. In order for this to be done this way, for OMB to come in, it would cost a half a billion dollars over about five years to implement the capacity to do what is currently being done with DHS. And in fact, that DHS uh, has, has been 17 separate times the Appropriations Committee has identified DHS as being the appropriate place for doing this and supported the operations that they have put in place going through the, the, the National Center for, uh, they, they call it the NKIC, this central place in which just this function can actually be done. So we're creating a bureaucracy here that is actually working contrary to the very bureaucracy that's already been put in place uh, to create this. So for, for, for all of the above reasons, I have tremendous concerns. I appreciate the dramatic growth uh, that is happening. And, and, and my ask isn't that we sort of blow this out of the water. I, I would hope that, I would just ask the chairman and, and, and the gentleman from Virginia uh, to give us the chance to perfect the language so that the responsibility lies not within the White House, quite honestly, but back here where we have the capacity in Congress to oversee this uh, and preferably in a security agency like DHS where this may be done. And I realize there's jurisdictional issues here, but I respectfully request that my colleagues consider the implications of the argument that I have just made and the implications of what we are doing by virtue of this vote. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back.
Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, uh, unanimous consent, the gentleman be recognized for two minutes. I thank the Chair. Just to respond, I, I very much appreciate um, the thoughtfulness of my colleagues' um, observations, but I would frankly, respectfully counter them. It, there's nothing new about OMB having a responsibility for policy guidance with respect to the subject. In fact, that goes back to my Republican predecessor in this job, also your Republican predecessor, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Davis. When we did FISMA, the relevant agency was OMB. The guidance on the subject is a document, M0716, issued in May of 07, on PII, data breaches, government-wide policy, OMB, promulgated by President Bush. It's not unique to this administration, not unique to this committee or this Congress. So I'd be glad to work with my colleague, and I know the chairman would, and the ranking member would as well, and I'm sure Mr. Pentabolio, in trying to make sure that uh, we get it right between now and going to the floor. But I, I, the idea that we're creating a new bureaucracy, that we're doing something revolutionary here, is simply not the case. Uh, OMB is the designated agency, and if we want to change that, or if another committee wants to change that, that's a different topic of conversation we certainly can have. But my amendment to this bill is perfectly consistent with past practice by this committee and, and policies enshrined uh, since we adopted FISMA a number of years ago, this committee, with the Republican chairman. Would the gentleman yield? Of course. Uh, would the gentleman ag agree to work with the chair and uh, uh, Mr. Meehan to work out report language that makes that position clear that oversight will continue to be similar to what it has been? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I not only would do that, I'd be glad to try to reinforce the point Mr. Meehan was making about the critical role of DHS and that that should not be, our intent isn't to change that. It is to simply codify uh, in law the statutory uh, backup of the policy guidance on B issues. I thank the gentleman. I thank the chair. Well, if 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 the gentleman by unanimous may, I'm sorry, additional may, minute. With, with the gentleman yield. Uh, if if the offer is that we look at this as a continuing way to resolve this 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 question, uh, I am grateful for the gentleman's offer to do so, and I hope that we may be able to do that as one of the few people that sits on both this committee and appreciates the importance of its jurisdiction, but also works uh, with Homeland Security. I am seeing firsthand the the remarkably changing way in which we are being confronted by this challenge. Uh, and even if the president, a Republican president, may have done this before, it does not necessarily mean it's right. And the problem is this whole homeland security was, was set up at a time in which the threat uh, was probably of a different sort initially, but we're watching the growth and changes of threat. And we have to be ready and willing in this Congress to be cognizant of the way it is changing and not be afraid to question that which has been done before and consider it sacrosanct because it was done before, but to look at the realities of what is happening and simplify the capacity for us to be able to operate in a way that maximizes the ability to protect the very people that we are obligated to do. And I believe that this kind of a format uh, would, be, would be better suited if it was coordinated and consistent. But I'm very grateful for the uh, gentleman's um, offer to continue to work with it. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. If there's no further discussion on the amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute, the question now occurs on the question, all those in favor of the gentleman from Virginia's amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. In, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, and the amendment to the amendment is agreed to. The question now occurs on, if there's no further amendments, the question now occurs on the, on the amendment in the nature of a substitute. All those in, in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any of those opposed? No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, the, the amendment in the nature of a substitute is agreed to. I now move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report the bill, H.R. 3635, to the, as amended to the House with a recommendation it is, that it do pass. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 3635 to the House as amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And H.R. 3635 is ordered reported to the House as amended. I now ask unanimous consent that the staff may be authorized to make necessary and conforming technical changes to the bill. Without objection, so ordered. The committee will now consider H.R. 4174, the Alaska Bypass Modernization Act. The clerk will please designate the bill. H.R. 4174, a bill to amend Title 39, United States Code, to modernize and improve Alaska bypass freight mail transportation. Without objection, H.R. 4174 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed and is in each of your folders. Recognizing myself, last Last week, Chairman Farenthal uh, and I introduced the Alaska Bypass Modernization Act. The bill uh, is <coughs> excuse me. The bill is designed to make a number of small tweaks to help improve the costly Alaska Bypass mail delivery system. Uh, as as currently designed, the system allows bulk orders of more than 1,000 pounds of what would otherwise be considered as freight be shipped by plane across the state of Alaska at a heavy discount even to what is commonly known as uh, parcel post. Currently, the discount is so significant that in some instances it can cost more than twice as much to ship the equivalent amount of goods over the roads of the lower 48 than by plane in Alaska. As we discussed at a subcommittee hearing last week, the current bypass mail system is mired in regulations and complications, specifically designed to lock out competition and protect incumbent carriers. In the current system, there is little incentive to compete. And in fact, the cost of $76.8 million to a certain extent comes from the fact that rates are determined by looking at the cost of those already in the system, meaning those in the system, if they spend the same or more, are rewarded by being paid a profit. Despite this uh, uh, dramatic subsidy, rural and native Alaskans are still paying significantly inflated prices for many of their basic goods. In one uh, dramatic example, a bag of potato chips cost $4.29 in Anchorage. But just 400 miles north, it cost $9.99 in Bethel, Alaska, despite the fact that the postal shipping cost is only 35 cents. The black box nature of the current system allows many to blame the full cost of the markup on, <laughs> excuse me, full cost of the markup on the cost of shipping to areas in which there are no roads. The truth is, remote shipping to Alaska in areas that have no roads must consent continue, and the post office will continue under this bill to be a major part of that delivery system. However, it is unacceptable to have a system that lacks both transparency and incentive to reduce the cost of delivery. This legislation we consider today, H.R. 4174, will take the first tentative steps toward real reform of the Alaskan bypass mail system to make it more transparent and at least slightly more competitive. The legislation would make four changes to the current system. One, it would give the post office, uh, Postal Service greater control over when mail is delivered to prevent half full planes from driving up the cost. It would allow bush carriers, and when we say bush carriers, often these are even float planes, to handle overflow mail on mainland routes at mainland prices. And I want to explain this briefly. You have a small airplane. It may be carrying only a few hundred or a thousand pounds of freight. If it were allowed to carry its maximum load, it would operate more efficiently. We are not considering paying them if you will, a rate that would be higher because they are a less efficient airplane, but rather allowing them to full to capacity and the additional uh, freight would be at the lower rate that the mainline carrier currently receives. This makes the less efficient entity more efficient while not diminishing the efficiency of large aircraft such as 737s. Three, it would allow 
more mail flights directly to the Bush villages, saving the Postal Service expensive terminal fees. In, in short, it means that instead of landing and taking off more times, an aircraft could fill to capacity and fly directly to the rural community it serves. These are common sense changes, ones that have, are broadly accepted by the post office, but in fact opposed in some cases by those who are part of the incumbent service, which in fact cost us more money. Rather than make the program better, many would like to keep it as it is. I cannot support that, and although I would be the first to say that in Washington, when we talk about a program that cost only $76 million and a savings of perhaps as little as $20 million, people say, why? The answer is because the United States Postal Service collects from all Americans for this, and you have a right not to pay one penny more for your service in the lower 48 than is it necessary by efficiency throughout the entire system. And with that, I recognize Mr. Cummings for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. On March 4th, the Federal Workforce Subcommittee held a hearing on the Alaska Bypass Program. I thank you and Chairman Farenthold for convening that hearing, which I and Ranking Member Lynch we requested so we could examine the programs complex operating structure before we considered additional legislation to change it. During last week's hearing, we heard testimony from several air carriers, the Department of Transportation and the Postal Service. We also heard from the Postal Service Inspector General, who issued a white paper in 2011 detailing the significant annual losses incurred by the Postal Service to pay for the bypass program, arguing that it has morphed into a program that puts the Postal Service in the position of financially supporting aviation industry, the state of Alaska, Bush merchants, and others." End of quote. We also heard compelling testimony from Senator Beckett and Congressman Don Young. They both argued that the current structure of the bypass program is meeting the unique needs of Alaska residents for mail service and passenger air service and should not be altered. On March 6, Chairman Ice introduced a second bill on this subject, H.R. 4174, which would implement wider reforms to the bypass program than this uh, previous, than this previous bill, H.R. 4011, the Alaska Bypass Fair Competition Act of 2014, which was ordered, reported by voice vote last month. H.R. 4174 would impose cost requir uh, requirements on the bypass program. At present, approximately 29 percent of the program's costs are covered by the postage rates paid by shippers. Under this bill, beginning in 2015, the bypass program would be required to cover at least 30 percent of its annual costs from the rates charged for the service. The cost recovery mandate would then increase by 4 percent annually until 2020, when the Postal Service would be required to cover at least 50 percent of the bypass program through shipping rates. At these costs, as these cost recovery rates escalate, however, the Postal Service would not be permitted to raise the rates charged for bypass mail by more than the increase in the consumer price index plus one additional percent. Consequently, it seems likely that the cost coverage required requirements mandated by 4174 would require uh, service reductions. H.R. 4174 also would reduce to once per week the number of flights to a bypass destination that carriers participating in the program would be required to make. And it would permit carriers providing bush service to provide service on mainland, mainline routes and under certain circumstances. Given the complexity of the bypass program, it is not clear what all the consequences of implementing 4174 would be, particularly the cost recovery requirement. The bypass program was created to meet unique local needs of Alaska arising from its limited road infrastructure in the remote location of many communities. It is also clear to me from our hearing that if all of the items carried on bypass were put back into the regular mail system, the Postal Service in Alaska would need significant resources to meet the demand. 
That said, the bypass program is providing a level of service to Alaska residents that is simply not available in the lower 48 states, and those who are receiving the service pay only a fraction of the cost. However, offering the bypass program will not solve the Postal Service's long-term fiscal, cha fiscal challenges, which can be addressed only by a comprehensive postal reform legislation. And, Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. Thank you. Does any other member wish to speak on the legislation? I'm going to move to strike the last word for myself for just a moment uh, for a colloquy with my ranking member. Mr. Cummings, I'm, uh, I'm amazed how fast you've become an expert on, on the uh, bypass. Uh, it has been a, an area of interest for me since I've been on the committee and I've made the trips. And I believe that you fairly stated many of the challenges that we are facing uh, in trying to legislate reforms. Uh, I wanted to assure you of only one thing and uh, that was in your statement that, that I want to make sure is clear. The way we wrote the legislation, the goal is, of course, to reach that 50 percent uh, coverage. The reductions are limited, though. In other words, they cannot stop service to areas. Uh, they must maintain at least a once-a-week service to every point in Alaska. And so the expectation is they may not reach by 2020 the 50 percent because they will be limited to cost of living plus 1 percent, and effectively, let's just say the 1 percent is all they really raise per year. So if, if they are trying to reach 4 percent a year and they only reach 1 percent and they have no other efficiency gains, we will still be subsidizing at significantly close to the same level. What we hope to do is to have the 1 percent increase be very achievable and, and rec reasonable for the people of Alaska, while the other 3 percent would be achieved through efficiencies that we believe are available, including the modernization of aircraft and, of course, the idea that full loads going directly to rural locations will help. Uh, but I share with the gentleman's concern that we on this committee oversee a multi-billion dollar problem of the postal system, and this is but a small part of it. But I appreciate the gentleman's effort to uh, become so familiar with this uh, small rural uh, problem, and I yield to the gentleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. One of the things I, I guess that is hard about the legislation is trying to figure out the impact of the, of the reforms. I, I listened to Beckage, Senator Beckage, and um, to Don Young. And I just have this one question. When we reduce the, reduce to one week the flights, um, how much impact do you think that will have? I'm just curious. I mean. Well, the, uh, the, the minimum of once a week uh, is based on the assumption that you have such a rural area and such a small load that an aircraft simply once a week would barely be full. Uh, the, the vast majority of the areas in Bethel, the city I mentioned, where for 35 cents you move uh, a bag of chips and it more than doubles in price, this is an area that has everyday flights and will continue to everyday flights. There are huge freight shipments because this is a city of tens of thousands of people. However, when you get to an Aleutian island like, or a, a rural island like the one that I visited, where you actually, the last part of the trip we did by hydrofoil. <laughs> Uh, they, they were receiving 17,000 pounds of, of freight, and they typically would get a delivery once or twice a, 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 a week. And that, that service was sufficient. Now, the hydrofoil can't operate through the entire year. There are times in which it can't operate at all over these rivers, and at that point, a different aircraft, a less efficient means, would come in. The aircraft would carry less, it probably, because this was a dirt, a mud runway. Uh, in, on this little island, it would clearly be a very small aircraft that would undoubtedly be able to make this, which would probably be several times a week, weather permitting. This complexity is part of the reason that we will always be subsidizing uh, Alaskan bypass mail, and we have owned up to it. What the Senator and, and Congressman Young said, though, was absolutely accurate. If we do away with bypass mail, it will actually cost the Postal Service more if little packages are delivered instead. It will cost the Alaskan people more, but it, it still would operate at a loss. So one of the reasons that it is so important, and I, and I share with the gentleman that we have to mend it, not end it, and, and with the Senator in the House, uh, Don Young, is this system saves the Post Office money. Sadly, it doesn't save the Post Office as much money as it saves the shipper. 
And that is the goal that we, uh, uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that we achieve. Nothing in the bill mandates any reduction in flights, but we want to try to empower them to be a little more efficient so that Alaskans continue to get almost the same price they now get, but the subsidy, at least in, in constant dollars, should drop a little bit. Uh, I would predict that when you and I are happily retired and writing our memoirs, that we will still be subsidizing more or less $76 million a year as long as Alaska remains rural and without roads. But I believe that this committee is doing the small step it takes, uh, and with regards to uh, both of the Alaska representatives that testified, I am committed to make sure that we maintain Alaskan bypass mail, that it is critical to the people I visited in Alaska. And uh, if you and I take a, a, a trip that can somehow include Alaska, I look forward to maybe visiting one of those rural islands with you and, and realizing how special the post office is to providing services to these people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Does any other member wish to speak? I will hold the record open until the end of the day so members may submit their written statements. If there is no further discussion, I move the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 4174 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 4174 to the House. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And H.R. 4174, the Alaskan Bypass Modernization Act, is ordered reported to the House. The Committee will now consider H.R. 4192 to amend the 1910 Heights of Buildings Act. The Clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 4192, a bill to amend the Act entitled An Act to Regulate the Height of Buildings in the District of Columbia to clarify the rules of the District of Columbia regarding human occupancy of penthouses above the top story of the building upon which the penthouse is placed. Without objection, H.R. 4192 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed and is in each of your folders. In 1910, the Heights of Buildings Act was signed into Federal law. L the law has prohibited New York City-style skyscrapers from being erected in our nation's capital. In limiting building heights in the District of Columbia, the Heights Act protects skylines of the city's monuments, memorials, and helps ensure public safety. The Committee has worked for several years to determine what, if any, modifications should be made to this over 100-year-old law changes that would empower the residents of the District of Columbia to determine shape and size of their own skyline without compromising Federal interests, such as maintenance of, uh, of prominence and other cities' great architectural symbols. Last Congress, this committee held a hearing on the Heights Act, and witnesses provided different perspectives on whether and how to modify the existing law. Delegate Norton and I subsequently wrote to the National Capital Planning Commission, NCPC, and the Mayor's Office asking them to jointly study the Heights Act and recommend changes if appropriate. The study was impressive, and aside from all the research work and a series of meetings, there were, <coughs> there was held, uh, there were held considerable input from experts, and general public alike helped the Mayor and the NCPC provide separate recommendations. Perhaps sadly, the Mayor's recommendation for specific increase of the heights of downtown and, and the Mayor's recommendation uh, that NCPC work together did not appear to bring us a single comprehensive plan, but rather a relatively different plan, a vision under the Mayor's leadership that spoke of greater heights in many areas, including LaFont City, without having to go back to Congress for approval. Ultimately, and only after considering broader changes, NCPC only recommended for the near term change was a modest one. The modest one was the specific enhancement of the existing Heights Act. What is this enhancement? Under, under existing law, so-called mechanical penthouses, 
that cover elevator shafts, mechanical uh, devices, air conditioning, and water towers, and other equipment can be built on rooftops. Even if the penthouse exceeds the height, height X other limitation, these can be built above it. So long, so long as one-to-one -one setback ratios are maintained between the penthouse and the height, uh, the height distance from one side to the other. This complex structural uh, requirement makes sense because, in fact, from the ground or even from the other side of the street at about 130 feet in the air, one does not see the mechanical equipment even though it is on the roof, and for that reason, from the ground, it appears as though we have a uniform uh, height for our buildings. NCPC, however, recommended human occupancy be allowed in such rooftop penthouses so long as the setback ratio is maintained and that the penthouse does not exceed one story, that it, that is, that it is no more than 20 feet in height, and again, so long as the city further approves the, the project. So the bill simply codifies the recommendation by NCPC and allows human occupancy and hopefully an attractive and humanly pleasant addition to the city, covering up what is now often from other vantages, including other buildings, ugly mechanical penthouse, penthouses that are currently allowed. I want to make it clear today, I would like to have gone further. I find it beyond my imagination that a city that so wants to take more responsibility in every area would find itself by a vote of 12 to 0 saying, don't give us further authority. And I'm deeply disappointed. But I understand that in this case, there may be some question about whether the city trusts itself in this way to control its skyline at this type. Therefore, I will hold open in this legislation the very possibility that in the near future, myself or some other chairman will be able to further enhance the skyline through legislation. Notwithstanding that, this is a compromise to the existing height, uh, height limit without a compromise to the skyline of the District of Columbia in any way. There will be some small requirements under this legislation that will, will pass to the, uh, the city. For example, under existing ordinance, the city has enacted an 18-foot guideline to what would otherwise be an unrestricted penthouse limit uh, held only by its setback. Under this legislation and in concert with NCPC, we specifically allow a 20-foot occupied uh, setback facility. We would expect the city to harmonize their allowance in new construction with this 20-foot setback and 20-foot height and one story. <clears throat> I understand that there will always be differences of opinion by city representatives. I understand why some city representatives do not want the city to have a greater, greater say. But I believe that those who do not want the city to have a greater say are simply trying to get what they want if they were to have an open and democratic process by preventing the, us from acting in a democratic way to give the federal city as much leeway as it can so long as it does not impact federal needs. The guidance that this chair will always give to the city mayor and city council is simply, we want to trust you. We want you to trust yourself. We want to give you every piece of home rule possible so long it is, as it does not impact a specific federal responsibility that we must withhold. I'm glad, in fact, that the city council is not opposing this Modest Height Act uh, change. And when Ms. Norton and I uh, introduced the bill yesterday, we did so with the acceptance of NCPC, the Mayor's Office, and City Council Chairman uh, Phil Mendelson. Again, I have a specific thank you for the, the NCPC for the work they did, gathering experts from around the world to talk about great capital cities to inspire the people of the District of Columbia to know that we can do better, that this city, although beautiful by its monuments, can be also enhanced by the buildings built in the private sector. 
I would like to specifically take a moment to thank Ms. Norton, Mayor Gray, and City Council Chairman uh, Mendelson, along with NCPC, for helping craft this modest change that I hope will be the first of one of many to be changed and that we not wait another 100 years. I urge support for the measure and I recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, I support this legislation which uh, amends the Federal Height Act of 1910, a law that limits the height of all buildings in the District of Columbia. Specifically, this bill allows human occupancy in the mechanical penthouses and establishes a 20-foot maximum height for such penthouses. I now yield to my colleague from the District of Columbia, uh, Ms. Holmes Norton, who has worked so hard and tirelessly not only on this legislation, but on so, so many things affecting uh, the district. And, you know, as I spend more and more time in the district and I see what is happening, I was told the other day we have got 57 cranes uh, building buildings. So um, I have not seen this kind of development hardly anywhere in the United States. And so I, I, I agree with the Chairman. I wish we could have done, done more. But again, I yield to my colleagues. Well, I thank the, the gentleman for his own hard work for the District of Columbia and for, for yielding to me, of course. And, uh, and I certainly thank the chairman for his very valuable and insightful work on this bill for initiating this study after 100 years. It's amazing that no one ever thought to even look at this 100-year-old bill to see if it fit and to see what should, should happen to it. Uh, I should indicate, because I know members wonder what, what in the world things affecting the District of Columbia are doing before this committee in the first place. This one belongs before this committee. The Height Act was passed long before the district had its own home rule. And it covers both monumental D.C. and hometown, both monumental Washington, I should say, and hometown D.C. So we have a mixture here. And the chairman was trying to sort it out. Now, I should further explain, because I think uh, I shared some of the, the chairman's uh, uh, wonderment uh, that uh, the city had a right for, for more, quote, home rule here and seemed not to want it. It wasn't that the city didn't want it. Mr. Chairman, it was an indication that the public does not, the D.C. public does not always trust its own public officials to maintain the residential quality of this city, which is its, one of its chief characteristics. Uh, so <laughs> the, the people are not altogether trusting what the elected officials would do with this home rule <laughs> seemed to say, why don't we just leave it the way it is, uh, which is the first time in my experience more than 20 years in the Congress that I've seen that. I certainly hope it will not be taken as an indication that the District of Columbia does not want as much home rule and statehood as it can get. But, but it certainly, in this case, uh, surprised uh, even me. But what was, I think, most rewarding, Mr. Chairman, was to see how you, who could see the kinds of forward vision of the, uh, of the National Capital Planning Commission, nevertheless uh, proceeded to work as you always have. I can't tell you how grateful we are that you have worked entirely in a home rule fashion. And when there have been disagreements, you have worked to sort them out. And here you had to work to sort out a disagreement between the very uh, branches of government themselves. And while it may not have reached your own uh, more lofty vision, I think that it probably is, is, is emblematic of the kinds of incremental way in which cities operate in which the Congress itself uh, often operates. Um, the, um, uh, uh, the common ground that I encourage the city to seek, since I, I was embarrassed that the city had different positions, I said, at least give me one position. Don't ask the chairman of the committee to sort this out. So I'm very grateful that the city immediately understood that uh, it should sort it out and that the city work, the, the chairman worked uh, so closely uh, with, the, with, the, with the city. Now this, uh, this may seem, uh, <laughs> this may seem rarefied talking about occupancy of, of penthouses, but after all the penthouses are there and some of them look like they're occupied anyway. Uh, and in a real sense this brings, it brings um, uh, into um, uh, sync uh, the, the way in which these penthouses are are uh, handled across the city, uh, out of sight, 
but uh, an additional space for people who may want to go there, for offices that may want to go there. Everybody in DC likes to go out on one of these roofs. At the same time, the public doesn't want these roofs to destroy the notion of uh, their residential scale. And, and the, the, the chairman's uh, uh, compromise um, that he worked with the city on um, gives authority to the city to decide uh, what to do with these penthouses, increasing the, the, the height to the height of a story, one story or 20 feet as it chooses. But it's not a mandate uh, to do so. So I believe that residents who were uh, without knowing a great deal, obviously, because it's rather complicated what we were doing, will we, when they learn what has happened, uh, will be satisfied as well. And I think the bill will enhance the district's ability uh, not only to make its own decisions, and when it has a disagreement, it's shown that it can, uh, and uh, will allow for uh, changes uh, that uh, the city is, is seeing anyway. Uh, and uh, to the extent that more changes are necessary, uh, the, the, obviously this committee is open to them, but what is important today is that an agreement satisfactory to all has been obtained. And I thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. I will hold the record open until the end of the day so all members may submit an uh, opening statement. And I am going to strike the last word uh, briefly so we can have a colloquy that I think is essential uh, with the gentlelady from uh, D.C. Eleanor, you did a, a wonderful job of, uh, of describing what we went through to, to get here today. And I am pleased that working with your staff and with uh, Chairman Mendelson's staff and the Mayor's staff and NCPC, we, we have something that enhances uh, what the city and its residents can do with what has sometimes been an eyesore. But I will say one thing that, we're, that, that the city should be ready for. And we, you and I have talked about this uh, before. L presuming that the next one of those cranes putting up a high-rise apartment building or condo unit uh, chooses to put a swimming pool on the top floor in those 20 feet, an indoor swimming pool, or a rec center or an athletic center or whatever they choose to do with this space that they now have with the setback, the city is still going to have to deal with a lot of areas that, quite frankly, they have dealt with on a a catch-as-catch-can basis for years, and that is that in that 20-foot setback or any other space on a roof, residents often find themselves uh, erecting uh, structures not knowing whether or not they really are allowed. So whether it is uh, a lawn chair and an umbrella, an awning, uh, in the case of some office buildings, what I call smokers' last haven <laughs> they can go to. Uh, the city is going to have to deal with that, and I would expect that, uh, that they will work together with the city council to make sure that whether it is the guardrail at the edge of the building, which of course cannot have a setback, we need to have that, uh, that structural protection of three or four feet, and they are going to have to deal with that. Um, the, uh, the temporary tents, the Fourth of July uh, erections that you have of, of various things for people to, to sit on. Uh, the, the plankarding, uh, and you name it, they are going to have to deal with it. And I hope that the city will view this 20 feet of occupancy as a real opportunity to look toward architectural and aesthetic benefits that are both functional for the residents, whether it's an office building or a, re or, or a apartment type residence, or quite frankly, uh, existing buildings that choose to modify. I hope the city looks at it as an opportunity. But I would like to offer today that you and I, uh, I think, can reach out to NCPC, the Mayor's Office and City Council and say, can't we look at the riverfront? Can't we look at Northeast? Can't we look at at least one zone to come back again and say, why not have a pilot in this area that we know is outside the question of height? and that for 100 years has not had the opportunity to even consider something of that sort. So it is not in this bill because I want to move something that becomes law. But I stand here just as, as willing to try to find an economic zone, and you have looked at them and helped do, uh, build them, and say, can't we find 
uh, you know, a, a few hundred acres somewhere on the edge of the city and offer a pilot that the folks that object to the height increase would not object to a blighted area being developed in a way that would be beneficial to the income of the city and also to the residents. So I, I offer you that and I yield to the gentlelady. Well, I thank you very much for those remarks, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> In its own way, this may become something of a pilot. When people see activity on the roofs and they they wonder whether or not with some high changes in a far further out in the city, uh, even more activity might be possible, I think you've started a conversation uh, that would otherwise certainly not have occurred. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do want to say uh, uh, what is very impressive to me is the extent to which you have mastered the details of this arcane <laughs> subject. This is a subject uh, that is, is husbanded in the minds of, 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 of a few district residents. I can name them all. <laughs> uh, and they guard, by the way, the Haida Act with their lives. They are uh, historians of the city. I believe that many of them were instrumental in warning the city uh, or the public, not the city, and warning the public, don't let any changes occur in the Hyde Act or else it's, you know, you're, you're on your way <laughs> to becoming Chicago and New York. Uh, and without those details, and certainly without the details of the chairman, you see who might live in the district, does not represent the district, has mastered, uh, they went with the bottom line rather than with the details. So I think you've done something important here. I don't know where I would have, if we, uh, the, in the, if the, if, given the, the differences uh, in the city, I thought some kind of compromise, I thought it, it might have been more substantial than this compromise. But I do think that um, the, the alerts that the city might be changing before their very eyes may may uh, uh, prove uh, not to be the case when people see the kinds of activities that begin to blossom in some parts of the city and perhaps in other parts of the city. Finally, let me close by saying, Mr. Mr. Chairman, this is a city that doesn't have any more land. <laughs> we have, we have, we have uh, um, literally, almost literally built on every blade of grass except the National Park Service land. <laughs> So there's, there's no place to go. We don't want to go up. So it's going to take creativity. It's going to take creative ideas. You certainly had a very important one. You've started a very important conversation on what the city should do as it seeks to increase its population. Thank you very much, Mr. I thank the gentlelady, and I'll plant one last seed. The Washington Redskins don't play in Washington. And I would invite the gentlelady to go to many of the new stadiums that have been built and they are often built with overlook buildings as part of the general plan. And I would hope that people who want to bring that economic activity, a stadium that bears Washington's name back to Washington, uh, that when they look at possible sightings, they look in, in the idea that a large and relatively high structure, which would be a, a football stadium, can in fact be surrounded and adorned uh, with buildings that represent an appropriate height for that area. So I, I see opportunities. I don't see them currently. And one of the reasons is that we have some economic challenges in, in, in wooing uh, the team into the city and building a world-class stadium. But again, that's for the city fathers. That's for you as their elected representative. I just wanted to make sure that we took this opportunity to say this committee must stand ready to assist in any way we can to enhance the federal city. And, and I thank the gentlelady for her leadership. Does any other member wish to speak on the bill? If there is no further uh, discussion, I move the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 4192 that with the House, the recommendation it do pass. The question is, on favorably reporting H.R. 4192 to the House, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, the motion is agreed to. H.R. 4192 to amend the uh, <clears throat> 1910 Heights of Buildings Act is ordered reported to the House. The committee will now consider H.R. 4185, the District of Columbia Courts Public Defender Service and Court Service and 
Offender Supervision Agency Act of 2014. The clerk will please, de please designate the bill. H.R. 4185, a bill to revise certain authorities of the District of Columbia Courts, the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency for the District of Columbia and the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia and for other purposes. Without objection, H.R. 4185 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed and is in each of your folders. The legislation introduced by Ms. Norton will provide increased flexibility to the District of Columbia and related entities. Among other provisions, the, the bill would grant the D.C. courts the ability that federal agencies possess to collect employee debts by docking their pay, authorize the Federal Court Service and Offender Supervision Agency the ability to operate an incentives-based program for offenders and allow the Public Defender Service to accept volunteers as employees. This is a straightforward and common sense bill, and I thank Ms. Norton for her work on it and urge all members support it. And I recognize the ranking member. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I support this legislation which would grant D.C. Courts, Public Defender Service, and the uh, Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency uh, authorities similar to those granted to Federal agencies and necessary for them to conduct their business in an efficient, safe, and fiscally sound manner. Uh, with that, I yield to the gentlelady from the District of Columbia. Uh, I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I associate myself with his remarks and the remarks of the chairman, and thank them both for uh, rapidly uh, taking hold of this bill and chairman for moving it today. Um, I need only add that this is also a, a hybrid of sorts. The bill is here because uh, these are federal agencies which serve the District of Columbia under the Revitalization Act, which took uh, certain state functions from the District of Columbia. And so we do have federal jurisdiction here, and we're only trying here to give them the same federal authorities that are routinely given to any federal agency, almost good housekeeping authorities, like the ability to order uniforms for, for certain of their officials. With the help of, of uh, a good friend, the former chairman uh, uh, um, of, a, of, a, of, the, of the appropriate committee in the Senate, Chairman Okaka, I did get a similar bill uh, passed uh, last uh, Congress called the D.C. Courts and Public Defender Service Act. So now that this bill, if this bill goes to the floor uh, and, and is approved, I do believe we will be able to get these authorities. And I thank the chairman. May I ask the chairman a question? Um, is it, uh, there, there was a buyout authority in this bill as well. Was that taken from the bill? Uh, I informed the gentlelady it has been removed. It was removed because it would have given us a mandatory score. And from a standpoint of moving this particular portion of the bill expeditiously, we, we wanted to avoid that. And we certainly will work with the gentlelady to find a, an appropriate way to pair it so that we could, uh, we could get that passed. I appreciate that, that explanation. There was no objection, of course, if it scores. Uh, I don't understand why it would, but I never understand scoring. Uh, uh, this is um, the, the reason I raise it is because we now have agencies using buyout authority throughout the federal government as we reduce the size of government. So it's it's important that uh, oh, th this agency, these agencies have the same authority. And I will certainly work with the chairman to see what what we can do to to um, to, to get to get through the scoring the, the scoring issue uh, so that these these. Are brought in these interesting scores, even though it reduces the cost of government, you know, because these employees are going to be gone. I'll leave that aside for a moment, but we'll see how we can work that out. And I appreciate the you working would, with me. If the gentleman would further yield, uh, you know, we've passed uh, FATARA to help reduce the cost and modernize, uh, you know, uh, procurement of IT. It scored. We passed the Data Act uh, that would harmonize data so that it would cost phenomenally less to search data, it scored. Sometimes the CBO is not the friend of progress. 
<laughs> but I will work with the gentlelady. The cost is relatively small, and I hope to be able to find an offset. And if we can, then uh, it will be reattached on the floor. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you. Chairman. Uh, I'll hold the record open to the end of the day so all members may submit written statements. Does any member wish to speak further? Does any member wish to amend the bill? If there's no further discussion, I move the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 4185 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 4185 to the House. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The uh, bill is agreed to. H.R. 4185, the District of Columbia Courts Public Defender Service and Court Service and Offender Supervision Agency Act of 2014 is ordered reported to the House. The committee will now consider H.R. 4194, the Government Reports Elimination Act. The clerk will please designate the bill. H.R. 4194, a bill to provide for the elimination or modification of federal reporting requirements. Without objection, H.R. 4194 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed and is in each of your folders. The Government Reports Elimination Act is part of the Committee's effort to re reduce waste and duplication in the Federal Government. It eliminates 118 unnecessary agency reports to Congress and eliminates or streamlines 10 required Government Accountability Office mandates. When Congress free we in Congress frequently create reporting requirements and laws we write. And we need from time to time to go through and see how many of those reporting requirements are, have become outdated and, we and, and as a result should be eliminated. This is to save the taxpayers money. It also is critical to make sure that when we say we want something reported, that it is reported and that when we no longer need it, we stop it. This bill is a product of more than a year's outreach to other House committees working off the recommendation provided by OMB and GAO. I want to particularly recognize Senator Mark Warner, who has been instrumental in getting GPRA Modernization Act of 2010 to require the Office of Management Budget to publish a list of unnecessary agency reports. In 2013, OMB posted a list on their website called performance.gov. Senator Warner is also introducing a companion bill along with uh, Senator Ayotte uh, this week that will, will allow us to jointly pass and eliminate these over 118 different report requirements. Once OMB uh, posts that list, <clears throat> Excuse me. Once OMB posted that list, I sent letters to every House committee asking them to vet OMB's list to make revisions as they saw fit. All but a few of the committees responded, and I appreciate the hard work of the chairman and their staffs and ranking members on all of the committees involved in these reports. This has allowed us to craft a solid, single, and workable list to uh, streamline the reporting requirement. The preparation of these reports diverts agency resources better spent on more relevant activities and for little gain. For example, a biannual report required of the State Department on Kosovo peacekeeping dates back to 1997 and has clearly been made irrelevant by the current foreign policy landscape. The bill also reduces unnecessary expenditures incurred by legislative branch Blanche's GAO office, in 2013, GAO identified mandates that appear to be both burdensome and unnecessary, and they came to, uh, to this committee asking that we take action. GAO does a great job uh, with few resources, and we should ensure that every resource th that they have is maximized in the most efficient way. The bill eliminates five GAO mandates that are no longer needed and streamlines another five to better tailor them to meet the government's current needs. The last time that a comprehensive reports elimination bill of this sort was signed into law was 1998, and it's well overdue. I'd like to particularly thank Mr. Conley, who for his support in this legislation as an original co-sponsor. I look forward to working with all of you on this bill 
uh, to make sure that it goes through the Senate. And I would also like to uh, give my appreciation to Mr. Woodall for signing on as a co-sponsor. Additionally, a shout out to the Transportation and Infrastructure uh, team who moved an independent bill that covered their areas. The fact is that this committee is harmonizing many committees, but we welcome all committees looking at mandates they have created and eliminating them as soon as possible. And with that, I recognize the Ranking Member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Congress often requires executive branch agencies to submit reports, and these reports enable Congress to scrutinize performance and assess agency goals. However, with the passage of time, reporting requirements sometimes become outdated and unnecessary. Congress and the executive branch recognize this in the Government Performance and Results Modernization Act of 2012, which required the Office of Management and Budget to identify potentially outdated or duplicative uh, reports and to provide views on their elimination to Congress. OMB produced a list in January of 2013 that identified more than 300 congressionally mandated reports that are potentially outdated or duplicative. In preparation for this markup, the majority and minority staffs heard from several committees expressing concerns about the elimination of specific reports within their jurisdiction. Mr. Chairman, our staffs were able to work together to identify specific reports that the committees of jurisdiction thought should continue to be produced. If additional concerns are expressed after this markup by either the majority or minority staffs of the affected committees, I would ask the Chair to continue that cooperation as the bills move towards the House floor. I believe the principle we should follow is that if either side wishes to retain a report, it should be retained. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The record will remain open until the end of the day, so any member who wishes to submit an uh, opening statement may. Does any member wish to further speak on the bill? Does any member wish to offer an amendment? If there is no further discussion, I now move the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform uh, report H.R. 4194 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. The question is unfavorably reporting H.R. 4194 to the House. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, and the bill is agreed to. H.R. 4194, the Government Reports Elimination Act, is ordered reported to the House. The Committee will now consider the following postal namings and block. H.R. 1391, H.R. 1451, H.R. 1458, H.R. 1813, H.R. 2062, H.R. 2391, H.R. 3060, H.R. 3472, H.R. 3609, H.R. 3765, and H.R. 4189. It is my intention to consider these bills by unanimous consent. Does any member wish to speak on the bill? The, the ranking members recognize. Mr. Chairman, I support the passage of the underlying postal renaming bills, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I now ask unanimous consent. The committee report the committee report the bill uh, the report the aforementioned bills. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that to consider the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 1228 that makes technical corrections to the bill. I ask unanimous consent the Committee favorably report H.R. 1228 as amended. Without objection, so ordered. The Committee will now consider two additional postal namings which were reported by the Committee and passed out of the House during the 112th Congress, H.R. 1036 and H.R. 1076. It is the intention of the Chair uh, to consider these two, H.R. Uh, 1376 and H.R. 1036. It is the intention of uh, the, the Chair to consider these two bills by unanimous con consent. Does any member wish to speak on the bill? Mr. Cummings. I support the, uh, the uh, doing it by unanimous consent, support the legislation. 
I thank the gentleman. I now ask unanimous consent the committee favorably report H.R. 1036 and H.R. 1376. Without objection, is so ordered. The committee stands adjourned. <laughs>